Chapter Nine of the Promised Land. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. The Promised Land by Mary Anton. Chapter Nine. The Promised Land. Having made such good time across the ocean, I ought to be able to proceed no less rapidly on terra firma, where, after all, I am more at home. And yet here is where I falter. Not that I hesitated, even for the space of a breath, in my first steps in America. There was no time to hesitate. The most ignorant immigrant on landing proceeds to give and receive greetings, to eat, sleep, and rise after the manner of his own country, wherein he is corrected, admonished, and laughed at, whether by interested friends or the most indifferent strangers. And his American experience is thus begun. The process is spontaneous on all sides, like the education of the child by the family circle. But while the most stupid nursery maid is able to contribute her part toward the result, we do not expect an analysis of the process to be furnished by any member of the family, least of all by the engaging infant. The philosophical maiden aunt alone, or some other witness equally psychological and aloof, is able to trace the myriad efforts by which the little Johnny or Nellie acquires a secure hold on the disjointed parts of the huge plaything, life. Now, I was not exactly an infant when I was set down, on a May day some fifteen years ago, in this pleasant nursery of America. I had long since acquired the use of my faculties, and had collected some bits of experience, practical and emotional, and had even learned to give an account of them. Still, I had very little perspective, and my observations and comparisons were superficial. I was too much carried away to analyze the forces that were moving me. My Polotsk I knew well before I began to judge it and experiment with it. America was bewilderingly strange, unimaginably complex, delightfully unexplored. I rushed impetuously out of the cage of my provincialism and looked eagerly about the brilliant universe. My question was, what have we here? Not, what does this mean? That query came much later. When I now become retrospectively introspective, I fall into the predicament of the centipede in the rhyme. Who got along very smoothly until he was asked which leg came after which, whereupon he became so rattled that he couldn't take a step. I know I have come on a thousand feet, on wings, winds, and American machines. I have leaped and run and climbed and crawled, but to tell which step came after which, I find a puzzling matter. Plenty of maiden aunts were present during my second infancy, in the guise of immigrant officials, school teachers, settlement workers. And sundry other unprejudiced and critical observers, their statistics I might properly borrow to fill the gaps in my recollections, but I am prevented by my sense of harmony. The individual we know is a creature unknown to the statistician, whereas I undertook to give the personal view of everything. So I am bound to unravel as well as I can the tangle of events, outer and inner, which made up the first breathless years of my American life. During his three years of probation, my father had made a number of false starts in business. His history for that period is the history of thousands who come to America, like him, with pockets empty, hands untrained to the use of tools, minds cramped by centuries of repression in their native land. Dozens of these men pass under your eyes every day, my American friend, too absorbed in their honest affairs to notice the looks of suspicion which you cast at them, the repugnance with which you shrink from their touch. You see them shuffle from door to door with a basket of spools and buttons, or bending over the sizzling irons in a basement tailor shop, or rummaging in your ash can, or moving a push cart from curb to curb at the command of the burly policeman, the Jew peddler, you say, and dismiss him from your premises and from your thoughts, never dreaming that the sordid drama of his days may have a moral that concerns you. What if the creature with the untidy beard carries in his bosom his citizenship papers? What if the cross-legged tailor is supporting a boy in college who is one day going to mend your state constitution for you? What if the ragpicker's daughters are hastening over the ocean to teach your children in the public schools? Think every time you pass the greasy alien on the street that he was born thousands of years before the oldest Native American, and he may have something to communicate with you when you too shall have learned a common language. Remember that his very physiognomy is a cipher, the key to which behooves you to search for most diligently. By the time we joined my father, he had surveyed many avenues of approach toward the coveted citadel of fortune. One of these, heretofore untried, 
he now proposed to essay, armed with new courage, and cheered on by the presence of his family. In partnership with an energetic little man, who had an English chapter in his history, he prepared to set up a refreshment booth on Crescent Beach. But while he was completing arrangements at the beach, we remained in town, where we enjoyed the educational advantages of a thickly populated neighborhood, namely, Wall Street, in the west end of Boston. Anybody who knows Boston knows that the west and north ends are the wrong ends of that city. They form the tenement district, or, in the newer phrase, the slums of Boston. Anybody who is acquainted with the slums of any American metropolis knows that that is the quarter where poor immigrants foregather to live, for the most part, as unkempt, half-washed, toiling, unaspiring foreigners, pitiful in the eyes of social missionaries, the despair of boards of health, the hope of ward politicians, the touchstone of American democracy. The well-versed metropolitan knows the slums as a sort of house of detention for poor aliens, where they live on probation till they can show a certificate of good citizenship. He may know all this, and yet not guess how Wall Street, in the West End, appears in the eyes of a little immigrant from Polotsk. What would the sophisticated sightseer say about Union Place, off Wall Street, where my new home waited for me? He would say that it is no place at all, but a short box of an alley. Two rows of three-story tenements are its sides. A stingy strip of sky is its lid. A littered pavement is the floor. And a narrow mouth its exit. But I saw a very different picture on my introduction to Union Place. I saw two imposing rows of brick buildings, loftier than any dwelling I had ever lived in. Brick was even on the ground for me to tread on, instead of common earth or boards. Many friendly windows stood open, filled with uncovered heads of women and children. I thought the people were interested in us, which was very neighborly. I looked up to the topmost row of windows, and my eyes were filled with a May blue of an American sky. In our days of affluence in Russia, we had been accustomed to upholstered parlors, embroidered linen, silver spoons and candlesticks, goblets of gold, kitchen shelves shining with copper and brass. We had feather beds heaped halfway to the ceiling. We had clothes presses, dusky with velvet and silk, and fine woolen. The three small rooms into which my father now ushered us, up one flight of stairs, contained only the necessary beds, with lean mattresses, a few wooden chairs, a table or two, a mysterious iron structure, which later turned out to be a stove, a couple of unornamental kerosene lamps, and a scanty array of cooking utensils and crackery. And yet we were all impressed with our new home and its furniture. It was not only because we had just passed through our seven lean years, cooking in earthen vessels, eating black bread on holidays, and wearing cotton. It was chiefly because these wooden chairs and tin pans were American chairs and pans, that they shone glorious in our eyes. And if there was anything lacking for comfort or decoration, we expected it to be presently supplied. At least we children did. Perhaps my mother alone, of us newcomers, appreciated the shabbiness of the little apartment and realized that for her there was as yet no laying down of the burden of poverty. Our initiation into American ways began with the first step on the new soil. My father found occasion to instruct or correct us even on the way from the pier to Wall Street, which journey we made crowded together in a rickety cab. He told us not to lean out of the windows, not to point, and explained the word greenhorn. We did not want to be greenhorns, and gave the strictest attention to my father's instructions. I do not know when my parents found opportunity to review together the history of Polotsk in the three years past, for we children had no patience with the subject. My mother's narrative was constantly interrupted by irrelevant questions, interjections, and explanations. The first meal was an object lesson of much variety. My father produced several kinds of food, ready to eat, without any cooking, from little tin cans that had printing all over them. He attempted to introduce us to a queer, slippery kind of fruit, which he called banana, but had to give it up for the time being. After the meal, he had better luck with a curious piece of furniture on runners, which he called rocking chair. There were five of us newcomers, and we found five different ways of getting into the American machine of perpetual motion, and as many ways of getting out of it. One born and bred to the use of a rocking chair cannot imagine how ludicrous people can make themselves when attempting to use it for the first time. We laughed immoderately over the various experiments with the novelty, which was a wholesome way of letting off steam after the unusual excitement of the day. 
In our flat, we did not think of such a thing as storing the coal in the bathtub. There was no bathtub. So in the evening of the first day, my father conducted us to the public baths. As we moved along in a little procession, I was delighted with the illumination of the streets. So many lamps, and they burned until morning, my father said, and so people did not need to carry lanterns. In America, then, everything was free, as we heard in Russia. Light was free, the streets were as bright as a synagogue on a holy day. Music was free. We had been serenaded, to our gaping delight, by a brass band of many pieces, soon after our installation on Union Place. Education was free. That subject my father had written about repeatedly, as comprising his chief hope for us children, the essence of American opportunity, the treasure that no thief could touch, not even misfortune or poverty. It was the one thing that he was able to promise us when he sent for us, surer, safer than bread or shelter. On our second day, I was thrilled with the realization of what this freedom of education meant. A little girl from across the alley came and offered to conduct us to school. My father was out, but we five between us had a few words of English by this time. We knew the word school. We understood. This child, who had never seen us till yesterday, who could not pronounce our names, who was not much better dressed than we, was able to offer us the freedom of the schools of Boston. No application made, no questions asked, no examinations, rulings, exclusions, no machinations, no fees. The door stood open for every one of us. The smallest child could show us the way. This incident impressed me more than anything I had heard in advance of the freedom of education in America. It was a concrete proof, almost the thing itself. One had to experience it to understand it. It was a great disappointment to be told by my father that we were not to enter upon our school career at once. It was too near the end of the term, he said, and we were going to move to Crescent Beach in a week or so. We had to wait until the opening of the schools in September. What a loss of precious time, from May till September! Not that the time was really lost. Even the interval on Union Place was crowded with lessons and experiences. We had to visit the stores and be dressed from head to foot in American clothing. We had to learn the mysteries of the iron stove, the washboard, and the speaking tube. We had to learn to trade with the fruit peddler through the window, and not to be afraid of the policeman. And above all, we had to learn English. The kind people who assisted us in these important matters form a group by themselves in the gallery of my friends. If I had never seen them from those early days till now, I should still have remembered them with gratitude. When I enumerate the long list of my American teachers, I must begin with those who came to us on Wall Street and taught us our first steps. To my mother, in her perplexity over the cook stove, the woman who showed her how to make the fire was an angel of deliverance. A fairy godmother to us children was she who led us to a wonderful country called Uptown, where, in a dazzlingly beautiful palace called a department store, we exchanged our hateful homemade European costumes, which pointed us out as greenhorns to the children on the street, for real American machine made garments, and issued forth glorified in each other's eyes. With our despised immigrant clothing, we shed also our impossibly Hebrew names. A committee of our friends, Several years ahead of us in American experience, put their heads together and concocted American names for us all. Those of our real names that had no pleasing American equivalents, they ruthlessly discarded, content if they retained the initials. My mother, possessing a name that was not easily translatable, was punished with the undignified nickname of Annie. Fetka, Joseph, and Deborah issued as Frida, Joseph, and Dora, respectively. As for poor me, I was simply cheated. The name they gave me was hardly new. My Hebrew name being Marasha in full, Mashka for short, Russianized into Maria, my friends said that it would hold good in English as Mary, which was very disappointing, as I longed to possess a strange sounding American name like the others. I am forgetting the consolation I had in this matter of names from the use of my surname, which I have had no occasion to mention until now. I found on my arrival that my father was Mr. Anton, on the slightest provocation, and not, as in Polotsk, on state occasions alone. And so I was Mary Anton, and I felt very important to answer to such a dignified title. It was just like America that even plain people should wear their surnames on weekdays. As a family, we were so diligent under instruction. So adaptable, and so clever in hiding our deficiencies, that when we made the journey to Crescent Beach in the wake of our small wagon load of household goods, 
My father had very little occasion to admonish us on the way, and I am sure he was not ashamed of us. So much we had achieved toward our Americanization during the two weeks since our landing. Crescent Beach is a name that is printed in very small type on the maps of the environs of Boston. But a life sized strip of sand curves from Winthrop to Lynn, and that is historic ground in the annals of my family. The place is now a popular resort for holiday crowds, and is famous under the name of Revere Beach. When the reunited Antons made their stand there, however, there were no boulevards, no stately bathhouses, no hotels, no gaudy amusement places, no illuminations, no showmen, no tawdry rabble. There was only the bright, clean sweep of sand, the summer sea, and the summer sky. At high tide, the whole Atlantic rushed in, tossing the seaweeds in his mane. At low tide, he rushed out, growling and gnashing his granite teeth. Between tides, a baby might play on the beach, digging with pebbles and shells, till it lay asleep on the sand. The whole sun shone by day, troops of stars by night, and the great moon in its season. Into this grand cycle of the seaside day I came to live and learn and play. A few people came with me, as I have already intimated, but the main thing was that I came to live on the edge of the sea. I, who had spent my life inland, believing that the great waters of the world were spread out before me in the Divina. My idea of the human world had grown enormously during the long journey. My idea of the earth had expanded with every day at sea. My idea of the world outside the earth now budded and swelled during my prolonged experience of the wide and unobstructed heavens. Not that I got any inkling of the conception of a multiple world. I had had no lessons in cosmogony, and I had no spontaneous revelation of the true position of the earth in the universe. For me, as for my father's, the sun set and rose, and I did not feel the earth rushing through space. But I lay stretched out in the sun, my eyes level with the sea. Till I seemed to be absorbed bodily by the very materials of the world around me, till I could not feel my hand as separate from the warm sand in which it was buried. Or I crouched on the beach at full moon, wondering, wondering between the two splendors of the sky and the sea. Or I ran out to meet the incoming storm, my face full in the wind, my being a tingle with an awesome delight to the tips of my fog matted locks flying behind. And stood clinging to some stake or upturned boat, shaken by the roar and rumble of the waves. So clinging, I pretended that I was in danger and was deliciously frightened. I held on with both hands and shook my head, exulting in the tumult around me, equally ready to laugh or sob. Or else I sat on the stillest days with my back to the sea, not looking at all, but just listening to the rustle of the waves on the sand, not thinking at all, but just breathing with the sea. Thus courting the influence of the sea and sky and variable weather, I was bound to have dreams, hints, imaginings. It was no more than this, perhaps, that the world as I knew it was not large enough to contain all that I saw and felt, that the thoughts that flashed through my mind, not half understood, unrelated to my utterable thoughts, concerned something for which I had as yet no name. Every imaginative growing child has these flashes of intuition, especially one that becomes intimate with some one aspect of nature. With me it was the growing time, that idle summer by the sea, and I grew all the faster because I had been so cramped before. My mind, too, had so recently been worked upon by the impressive experience of a change of country, that I was more than commonly alive to impressions, which are the seed of ideas. Let no one suppose that I spent my time entirely, or even chiefly, in inspired solitude. By far the best part of my day was spent in play. Frank, hearty, boisterous play, such as comes natural to American children. In Polotsk, I had already begun to be considered too old for play, excepting set games or organized frolics. Here I found myself included with children who still played, and I willingly returned to childhood. There were plenty of playfellows. My father's energetic little partner had a little wife and a large family. He kept them in the little cottage next to ours, and that the shanty survived the tumultuous presence of that brood is a wonder to me to day. The young Wilners included an assortment of boys, girls, and twins, of every possible variety of age, size, disposition, and sex. They swarmed in and out of the cottage all day long, wearing the door sill hollow and trampling the ground to powder. They swung out of windows like monkeys, slid up the roof like flies, and shot out of trees like fowls. Even a small person like me couldn't go anywhere without being run over by a Wilner. And I could never tell which Wilner it was, because none of them ever stood still long enough to be identified. 
and also because I suspect that they were in the habit of interchanging conspicuous articles of clothing, which was very confusing. You would suppose that the little mother must have been utterly lost, bewildered, trodden down in this horde of urchins, but you are mistaken. Mrs. Wilner was a positively majestic little person. She ruled her brood with the utmost coolness and strictness. She had even the biggest boy under her thumb, frequently under her palm. If they enjoyed the wildest freedom outdoors, indoors the young Wilners lived by the clock. And so, at five o'clock in the evening, on seven days in the week, my father's partner's children could be seen in two long rows around the supper table. You could tell them apart on this occasion, because they all had their faces washed. And this is the time to count them. There are twelve little Wilners at table. I managed to retain my identity in this multitude somehow, and while I was very much impressed with their numbers, I even dared to pick and choose my friends among the Wilners. One or two of the smaller boys I liked best of all, for a game of hide and seek, or a frolic on the beach. We played in the water like ducks, never taking the trouble to get dry. One day I waded out with one of the boys to see which of us dared to go farthest. The tide was extremely low, and we had not wet our knees when we began to look back to see if familiar objects were still in sight. I thought we had been waiting for hours, and still the water was so shallow and quiet. My companion was marching straight ahead, so I did the same. Suddenly a swell lifted us almost off our feet, and we clutched at each other simultaneously. There was a lesser swell, and little waves began to run, and a sigh went up from the sea. The tide was turning. Perhaps a storm was on its way. And we were miles, dreadful miles, from dry land. Boy and girl turned without a word, four determined bare legs plowing through the water, four scared eyes straining toward the land. Through an eternity of toil and fear, they kept dumbly on, death at their heels, pride still in their hearts. At last they reached high water mark, six hours before full tide. Each has seen the other afraid, and each rejoices in the knowledge. But only the boy is sure of his tongue. You was scared, weren't you? he taunts. The girl understands so much, and is able to reply. You can swimmin', I not. Bet your life I can swimmin', the other mocks. And the girl walks off, angry and hurt. And I can walk on my hands, the tormentor calls after her. Say, you greenhorn, why don't you look? The girl keeps straight on, vowing that she would never walk with that rude boy again, neither by land nor sea, not even though the water should part at his bidding. I am forgetting the more serious business which had brought us to Crescent Beach. While we children disported ourselves like mermaids and mermen on the surf, our respective fathers dispensed cold lemonade, hot peanuts, and pink popcorn, and piled up our respective fortunes, nickel by nickel, penny by penny. I was so very proud of my connection with the public life of the beach. I greatly admired our shining soda fountain, the rows of sparkling glasses, the pyramids of oranges, the sausage chains. The neat white counter, and the bright array of tin spoons. It seems to me that none of the other refreshment stands on the beach, there were a few, were half so attractive as ours. I thought my father looked very well in a long white apron and shirt sleeves. He dished out ice cream with enthusiasm, so I supposed he was getting rich. It never occurred to me to compare his present occupation with the position for which he had been originally destined, or if I thought about it, I was just as well content. For by this time I had heard my father saying, America is not Polotsk. All occupations were respectable, all men were equal in America. If I admired the soda fountain and the sausage chains, I almost worshipped the partner, Mr. Wilner. I was content to stand for an hour at a time watching him make potato chips. In his cook's cap and apron, with a ladle in his hand and a smile on his face, he moved about with the greatest agility, whisking his raw materials out of nowhere. Dipping into his bubbling kettle with a flourish, and bringing forth the finished product with a caper. Such potato chips were not to be had anywhere else on Crescent Beach. Thin as tissue paper, crisp as dry snow, and salty as the sea. Such thirst producing, lemonade selling, nickel bringing potato chips only Mr. Wilner could make. On holidays, when dozens of family parties came out by every train from town, he could hardly keep up with the demand for his potato chips. And with a waiting crowd around him, our partner was at his best. He was as valuable as he was skillful, and as witty as he was valuable, at least so I guessed from the laughter that frequently drowned his voice. I could not understand his jokes, but if I could get near enough to watch his lips and his smile and his merry eyes, I was happy. 
That any one could talk so fast and in English was marvel enough, but that this prodigy should belong to our establishment was a fact to thrill me. I had never seen anything like Mr. Wilner, except a wedding jester, but then he spoke common Yiddish. So proud was I of the talent and good taste displayed at our stand, that if my father beckoned to me in the crowd and sent me on an errand, I hoped the people noticed that I, too, was connected with the establishment. And all this splendor and glory and distinction came to a sudden end. There was some trouble about a license, some fee or fine. There was a storm in the night that damaged the soda fountain and other fixtures. There was talk and consultation between the houses of Anton and Wilner, and the promising partnership was dissolved. No more would the merry partner gather the crowd on the beach. No more would the twelve young Wilners gamble like mermen and mermaids in the surf. And the less numerous tribe of Anton must also say farewell to the jolly seaside life. For men in such humble business as my father's carry their families, along with their other earthly goods, wherever they go, after the manner of the gypsies. We had driven a feeble stake into the sand. The jealous Atlantic, in conspiracy with the Sunday law, had torn it out. We must seek our luck elsewhere. In Polotsk, we had supposed that America was practically synonymous with Boston. When we landed in Boston, the horizon was pushed back, and we annexed Crescent Beach. And now, espying other lands of promise, we took possession of the province of Chelsea, in the name of our necessity. In Chelsea, as in Boston, we made our stand in the wrong end of the town. Arlington Street was inhabited by poor Jews, poor Negroes, and a sprinkling of poor Irish. The side streets leading from it were occupied by more poor Jews and Negroes. It was a proper locality for a man without capital to do business. My father rented a tenement with a store in the basement. He put in a few barrels of flour and of sugar, a few boxes of crackers, a few gallons of kerosene, an assortment of soap of the Save the Coupon brands, in the cellar a few barrels of potatoes, and a pyramid of kindling wood. In the showcase, an alluring display of penny candy. He put out his sign, with a gilt lettered warning of strictly cash, and proceeded to give credit indiscriminately. That was the regular way to do business on Arlington Street. My father, in his three years' apprenticeship, had learned the tricks of many trades. He knew when and how to bluff. The legend of strictly cash was a protection against notoriously irresponsible customers, while none of the good customers, who had a record for paying regularly on Saturday, hesitated to enter the store with empty purses. If my father knew the tricks of the trade, my mother could be counted on to throw all her talent and tact into the business. Of course, she had no English yet, but as she could perform the acts of weighing, measuring, and mental computation of fractions mechanically, she was able to give her whole attention to the dark mysteries of the language, as intercourse with her customers gave her opportunity. In this she made such rapid progress that she soon lost all sense of disadvantage, and conducted herself behind the counter very much as if she were back in her old store in Polotsk. It was far more cozy than Polotsk, at least so it seemed to me. For behind the store was the kitchen, where, in the intervals of slack trade, she did her cooking and washing. Arlington Street customers were used to waiting while the storekeeper salted the soup or rescued a loaf from the oven. Once more, fortune favored my family with a thin little smile, and my father, in reply to a friendly inquiry, would say, One makes a living, with a shrug of the shoulders that added, but nothing to boast of. It was characteristic of my attitude toward bread and butter matters that this contented me. And I felt free to devote myself to the conquest of my new world. Looking back to those critical first years, I see myself always behaving like a child let loose in a garden to play and dig and chase the butterflies. Occasionally, indeed, I was stung by the wasp of family trouble, but I knew a healing ointment, my faith in America. My father had come to America to make a living. America, which was free and fair and kind, must presently yield him what he sought. I had come to America to see a new world, and I followed my own ends with the utmost assiduity. Only, as I ran out to explore, I would look back to see if my house were in order behind me, if my family still kept its head above water. In after years, when I passed as an American among Americans, if I was suddenly made aware of the past that lay forgotten, if a letter from Russia, or a paragraph in the newspaper, or a conversation overheard in the street car, Suddenly reminded me of what I might have been. I thought it a miracle that I, Mashka, the granddaughter of Raphael the Russian, born to a humble destiny, should be at home in an American metropolis, be free to fashion my own life, 
and should dream my dreams in English phrases. But in the beginning my admiration was spent on more concrete embodiments of the splendors of America, such as fine houses, gay shops, electric engines and apparatus, public buildings, illuminations and parades. My early letters to my Russian friends were filled with boastful descriptions of these glories of my new country. No native citizen of Chelsea took such pride and delight in its institutions as I did. It required no fife and drum corps, no Fourth of July procession, to set me tingling with patriotism. Even the common agents and instruments of municipal life, such as the letter carrier and the fire engine, I regarded with a measure of respect. I know what I thought of people who said that Chelsea was a very small, dull, unaspiring town, with no discernible excuse for a separate name or existence. The apex of my civic pride and personal contentment was reached on the bright September morning when I entered the public school. That day I must always remember, even if I live to be so old that I cannot tell my name. To most people, their first day at school is a memorable occasion. In my case, the importance of the day was a hundred times magnified, on account of the years I had waited, the road I had come, and the conscious ambitions I entertained. I am wearily aware that I am speaking in extreme figures, in superlatives. I wish I knew some other way to render the mental life of the immigrant child of reasoning age. I may have been ever so much an exception in acuteness of observation, powers of comparison, and abnormal self-consciousness. None the less were my thoughts and conduct typical of the attitude of the intelligent immigrant child toward American institutions. And what the child thinks and feels is a reflection of the hopes, desires, and purposes of the parents who brought him overseas, no matter how precautious and independent the child may be. Your immigrant inspectors will tell you what poverty the foreigner brings in his baggage, what want in his pockets. Let the overgrown boy of twelve, reverently drawing his letters in the baby class, testify to the noble dreams and high ideals that may be hidden beneath the greasy caftan of the immigrant. Speaking for the Jews, at least, I know I am safe in inviting such an investigation. Who were my companions on my first day at school? Whose hand was in mine, as I stood, overcome with awe, by the teacher's desk, and whispered my name, as my father prompted? Was it Frida's steady, capable hand? Was it her loyal heart that throbbed, beat for beat, with mine, as it had done through all our childish adventures? Frida's heart did throb that day but not with my emotions. My heart pulsed with joy and pride and ambition. In her heart, longing fought with abnegation. For I was led to the schoolroom, with its sunshine and its singing and the teacher's cheery smile. While she was led to the workshop, with its foul air, care faces, and the foreman's stern command. Our going to school was the fulfillment of my father's best promises to us and Frida's share in it was to fashion and fit the calico frocks in which the baby sister and I made our first appearance in a public schoolroom. I remember to this day the gray pattern of the calico. So affectionately did I regard it as it hung upon the wall, my consecration robe awaiting the beatific day. And Frida, I am sure, remembers it too. So longingly did she regard it as the crisp, starchy breadths of it slid between her fingers. But whatever were her longings, she said nothing of them. She bent over the sewing machine, humming an old-world melody. In every straight, smooth seam, perhaps, she tucked away some lingering impulse of childhood. But she matched the scrolls and flowers with the utmost care. If a sudden shock of rebellion made her straighten up for an instant, the next instant she was bending to adjust a ruffle to the best advantage. And when the momentous day arrived, and the little sister and I stood up to be arrayed, it was Frida herself who patted and smoothed my stiff new calico, who made me turn round and round to see that I was perfect, who stooped to pull out a disfiguring basting thread. If there was anything in her heart besides sisterly love and pride and good will, as we parted that morning, it was a sense of loss, and a woman's acquiescence in her fate, for we had been close friends, and now our ways would lie apart. Longing she felt, but no envy. She did not grudge me what she was denied. Until that morning we had been children together, but now, at the fiat of her destiny, she became a woman, with all a woman's cares, whilst I, so little younger than she, was bidden to dance at the May festival of untroubled childhood. I wish for my comfort that I could say that I had some notion of the difference in our lots, some sense of the injustice to her, of the indulgence to me. I wish I could even say that I gave serious thought to the matter. 
There had always been a distinction between us, rather out of proportion to the difference in our years. Her good health and domestic instincts had made it natural for her to become my mother's right hand, in the years preceding the emigration, when there were no more servants or dependents. Then there was the family tradition that Mary was the quicker, the brighter of the two, and that hers could be no common lot. Frida was relied upon for help, and her sister for glory. And when I failed as a milliner's apprentice, while Frida made excellent progress at the dressmaker's, our fates indeed were sealed. It was understood, even before we reached Boston, that she would go to work and I to school. In view of the family prejudices, it was the inevitable course. No injustice was intended. My father sent us hand in hand to school before he had ever thought of America. If in America he had been able to support his family unaided, it would have been the culmination of his best hopes to see all his children at school, with equal advantages at home. But when he had done his best, and was still unable to provide even bread and shelter for us all, he was compelled to make us children self supporting as fast as it was practicable. There was no choosing possible. Frida was the oldest, the strongest, the best prepared, and the only one who was of legal age to be put to work. My father has nothing to answer for. He divided the world between his children in accordance with the laws of the country and the compulsion of his circumstances. I have no need of defending him. It is myself that I would like to defend, and I cannot. I remember that I accepted the arrangements made for my sister and me without much reflection. And everything that was planned for my advantage, I took as a matter of course. I was no heartless monster, but a decidedly self centered child. If my sister had seemed unhappy, it would have troubled me. But I am ashamed to recall that I did not consider how little it was that contented her. I was so preoccupied with my own happiness that I did not half perceive the splendid devotion of her attitude towards me, the sweetness of her joy in my good luck. She not only stood by approvingly when I was helped to everything, she cheerfully waited on me herself, and I took everything from her hand as if it were my due. The two of us stood a moment in the doorway of the tenement house on Arlington Street, that wonderful September morning when I first went to school. It was I that ran away, on winged feet of joy and expectation. It was she whose feet were bound in the treadmill of daily toil. And I was so blind that I did not see that the glory lay on her, and not on me. Father himself conducted us to school. He would not have delegated that mission to the President of the United States. He had awaited the day with impatience equal to mine, and the visions he saw as he hurried us over the sun flecked pavements transcended all my dreams. Almost his first act on landing on American soil, three years before, had been his application for naturalization. He had taken the remaining steps in the process with eager promptness, and at the earliest moment allowed by the law, he became a citizen of the United States. It is true that he had left home in search of bread for his hungry family. But he went blessing the necessity that drove him to America. The boasted freedom of the new world meant to him far more than the right to reside, travel, and work wherever he pleased. It meant the freedom to speak his thoughts, to throw off the shackles of superstition, to test his own fate, unhindered by political or religious tyranny. He was only a young man when he landed, thirty two, and most of his life he had been held in leading strings. He was hungry for his untasted manhood. Three years passed in sordid struggle and disappointment. He was not prepared to make a living even in America, where the day laborer eats wheat instead of rye. Apparently, the American flag could not protect him against the pursuing nemesis of his limitations. He must expiate the sins of his fathers who slept across the seas. He had been endowed at birth with a poor constitution, a nervous, restless temperament, and an abundance of hindering prejudices. In his boyhood, his body was starved, that his mind might be stuffed with useless learning. In his youth, this dearly gotten learning was sold, and the price was the bread and salt which he had not been trained to earn for himself. Under the wedding canopy, he was bound for life to a girl whose features were still strange to him, and he was bidden to multiply himself, that sacred learning might be perpetuated in his sons, to the glory of the God of his fathers. All this while he had been led about as a creature without a will. A chattel, an instrument. In his maturity he awoke, and found himself poor in health, poor in purse, poor in useful knowledge, and hampered on all sides. At the first nod of opportunity he broke away from his prison, and strove to atone for his wasted youth by a life of useful labor, 
while at the same time he sought to lighten the gloom of his narrow scholarship by freely partaking of modern ideas. But his utmost endeavor still left him far from his goal. In business nothing prospered with him. Some fault of hand or mind or temperament led him to failure where other men found success. Wherever the blame for his disabilities he placed, he reaped their bitter fruit. "'Give me bread!' he cried to America. "'What will you do to earn it?' the challenge came back. And he found that he was master of no art, of no trade, that even his precious learning was of no avail, because he had only the most antiquated methods of communicating it. So in his primary quest he had failed. There was left him the compensation of intellectual freedom, that he sought to realize in every possible way. He had very little opportunity to prosecute his education, which, in truth, had never been begun. His struggle for a bare living left him no time to take advantage of the public evening school, but he lost nothing of what was to be learned through reading, through attendance at public meetings, through exercising the rights of citizenship. Even here he was hindered by a natural inability to acquire the English language. In time, indeed, he learned to read, to follow a conversation or lecture, but he never learned to write correctly, and his pronunciation remains extremely foreign to this day. If education, culture, the higher life were shining things to be worshipped from afar, he had still a means left whereby he could draw one step nearer to them. He could send his children to school, to learn all those things that he knew by fame to be desirable. The common school, at least, perhaps high school, for one or two, perhaps even college. His children should be students, should fill his house with books and intellectual company, and thus he would walk by proxy in the Eliasian fields of liberal learning. As for the children themselves, he knew no surer way to their advancement and happiness. So it was with a heart full of longing and hope that my father led us to school on that first day. He took long strides in his eagerness, the rest of us running and hopping to keep up. At last the four of us stood around the teacher's desk, and my father, in his impossible English, gave us over to her charge, with some broken word of his hopes for us that his swelling heart could no longer contain. I venture to say that Miss Nixon was struck by something uncommon in the group we made, something outside of Semitic features and the abashed manner of the alien. My little sister was as pretty as a doll, with her clear pink and white face, short golden curls, and eyes like blue violets when you caught them looking up. My brother might have been a girl, too, with his cherubic contours of face, rich red color, glossy black hair, and fine eyebrows. Whatever secret fears were in his heart, remembering his former teachers, who had taught with the rod, he stood up straight and uncringing before the American teacher, his cap respectfully doffed. Next to him stood a starved-looking girl with eyes ready to pop out, and short dark curls that would not have made much of a wig for a Jewish bride. All three children carried themselves rather better than the common run of green pupils that were brought to Miss Nixon. But the figure that challenged attention to the group was the tall, straight father, with his earnest face and fine forehead, nervous hands eloquent in gesture, and a voice full of feeling. This foreigner who brought his children to school as if it were an act of consecration, who regarded the teacher of the primer class with reverence, who spoke of visions like a man inspired in a common schoolroom, was not like other aliens who brought their children in dull obedience to the law, was not like the native fathers who brought their unmanageable boys, glad to be relieved of their care. I think Miss Nixon guessed what my father's best English could not convey. I think she divined that by the simple act of delivering our school certificates to her, he took possession of America. End of chapter 9